Well, today on the show, this is for all of us who've ever walked into the bookstore, especially in the last two or three years, looked around and said, hey, what's with all the vampire, werewolf, and zombie books? We're going to meet an Arkansas author based here in Conway, Arkansas, who has produced one of the latest works on that subject. In fact, the subgenre of zombies is Robin Becker's latest work. It's called Brains, a Zombie Memoir. We'll talk about her book, and we'll also try to get some insights on why seemingly more and more of us in this day and age would love nothing more than to curl up with something that just absolutely horrifies us. That's today on the same page. So here's Robin Becker. She's made the short walk over from her HQ over at UCA. And, and welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thanks for doing this for us today. Well, let's start with the title of the book. It's a zombie book. So why is the title primarily brains? What's, what's significant about brains? Well, zombies love brains. They will eat them anytime, anywhere. But they'll eat other body parts as well. Okay. But the brains are really the choice. Why? Why are the? Why are the brains? They, they just taste. Well, can zombies can't even taste though, can they? Or can they? Oh yes, they can. They taste can smell. The they can taste the deliciousness, the fecundity, the uh, aroma, the fragrance. They can taste. Well, they can smell brains uh, from a distance. At least okay. in my book, they can. And there's sure. a lot of different zombie mythologies, and then they zero in on the brains, and it's the. It's like the foie gras of uh, Got it. the body. Okay, yeah, bon appetit. Mm -hmm. well, look, you say there's a lot of different zombie <laughs> mythologies. Mm -hmm. So let's let's work over your zombie mythology, your zombie rules of the road or rules of order, if you will. Let's let's talk about what uh, what, what uh, who are zombies first in your book. Well, my main character is Jack Barnes and he was a professor in life and okay. he is zombified, but he's one of the lucky few who retains sentience. He has cognition. He can okay. think and he can write. He can't talk. He can't operate a car. There's a lot. He has a lot of zombie limitations. Okay. But he can still. He's not brain dead. Okay. He's just a brain eater. He's a college. So so it, and he's the voice. <clears throat> the voice in his person. head is, is the mm -hmm. first person narrator of the story in the, in the book. And, and how convenient for you. You're a college professor. I so know. You can, what a coincidence. It worked out that it way. It really did. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> a, I'm not almost a by design. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so that's and and you sort of get to. I mean that's the that's the beauty of this book. You sort of. Since there is no universal, worldwide accepted code of zombies, you sort of get to, to write the rules of life and death as far as your main characters go as the story moves on, right? Right, yeah. right. Um, a lot of people, I've had some reactions from the zombie community, um, distressed that my zombie can actually think, sure. saying, oh, that's breaking the rules. But I realize... Crossing the line. Crossing the line, but yeah, I tell yeah. them, I, well, I have told them in... When you say the zombie community, first. you're talking about people who are fans of zombies, yes, not, well, not the actual zombies right, who walk Right, mainly the online yeah. zombie community. But okay. then I explain that any disease will display or present mutations. And clearly, if every single zombie is brain dead, there's going to be some kind of mutation where uh, anytime somebody might be resistant to a virus, they might be a carrier, there might be some kind of mutation where the zombie will be able to think. Also, a virus wants to survive. And if every single zombie is brain dead and eats every single human, when the zombies the die out, the virus will die out. Yeah. So the, uh, it makes sense that there would be that kind of mutation in order for the, the virus to survive. All yeah. right. Heretofore, they've not been considered sentient characters, not no. with a consciousness and, and, a, and an inner life, uh, so, so to speak. All. But your book breaks, breaks through that wall. It Can does. They, could they always uh, uh, talk, or could they not ever talk? Oh, them? they just say, mm, mm. Most okay. of the time. But I do have one character who comes on later in the, in the book named Ross, and he's after Rosencrantz from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, the, the, uh, Shakespeare, the Hamlet. Right, characters. right. Yeah, yeah. And um, he can talk. He doesn't say much, but he can talk enough. The, Jack, along the way, meets a bunch of different zombies, and they all have a, a different power, okay. like a superpower. So yeah. Jack can think and write. Ross can talk. There's a little guy, Guts, and he can move at human speed. He's very yeah. fast. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then there's a nurse, and she has the ability to sew everybody up and to make them well, uh, you know, to That's patch what they up. used to call a bomber crew in the old Hollywood yeah. parlance. They, they, they just each had different powers that they brought to the table. Exactly. So. Yeah, they're Which like is, super friends. Sure, they are the super friends. Yeah, yeah. On a road trip uh, across middle America. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to, we'll get to, get to that, but I still want get, to get all our rules, zombie rules okay. established. Now, how do zombies get around? I mean, obviously, they're... 
decaying. Mm -hmm. Their physical bodies are decaying, which is all they have is their physical bodies. Right. Right. So how do you, how do you get they around They shamble. Jerusalem? Shambling they, they, is the word. Yes. Yeah. They kind of shuffle, limp uh, to their destinations. So, so if you think of the old Night of the Living Dead, George exactly. Romero movie, that's, that's the way most of the zombie community, as you call them, right. would say that they get around. Right. Well, there are some exceptions now in film. The remake of Dawn of the Dead that came out in 1990, oh, 2004, which was a remake of the original Romero Dawn of the Dead, uh -huh. had fast zombies. And there were a lot of people in the zombie community who were upset that the zombies could actually move, move faster than humans. Yeah. And then there's a whole group of movies that are not quite zombies, but they're people like the 28 Days Later, um, mm -hmm. that, that those zombies move quickly because they're not exactly zombies, they're humans that have been infected with the rage virus, which makes them act zombie-like. Okay, all right. So there's a lot of different, it's a complicated it is. Uh, it's, hierarchy. It's, it's a diverse world, yes, it's a diverse community. It is. Are, are zombies supernatural characters, or are they just sort of the, the result of, of a biological breakdown? That's a really interesting question, and it's something that my main character grapples with. Um, okay. He wonders at times if he is supernatural because he is immortal. If he can keep his decaying body moving, if he can keep himself, if he can stop the decay, he will live forever. Because the only way, you, unless somebody shoots him in the brain or chops off his head or burns him, but he won't die from anything else except that, or or he'll just decay. But his his body will decay. I mean, he can't. But if they he can, have he's, no way to stop the decaying. At well, all, right? or no, or no. I, there's a, I've been thinking about if I were to do a sequel, which I'm not sure if I'm going to yet, that he would become a zomborg. A zomborg? Yes. Yeah, he so would take a zombie mechanical cyborg. sort of he, Right, a sort of a body. steampunk zombie. He would have, that okay. would be the only way to survive. But to get back to your original question about whether or not he's supernatural, I think they yeah. do start off with a uh, biological basis in that it is a virus and it is uh, just a disease. But that they do move, at least my characters do move towards the supernatural because they start to accept the idea of immortality. Uh -huh. And that makes them, at least my main character, feel kind of godlike. He has a bit of a messianic Jesus complex. Yeah. Uh, who do they represent when, when you look at why, we, why we're fascinated? Not all of us, but a lot of us are fascinated mm -hmm. with zombies. Who do, who, what, what do they represent? What, what, what among us, what, what fear or what, what entity, mm -hmm. what other in the back of our minds do, or, do you think zombies stand in for? Well, I think two things. I think they represent the primal fear of death that everybody has. What is going to happen after we die? Nobody okay. really knows. People think people have their ideas, but nobody's come back to say for sure. And so um, we would all like to live on, either in heaven or as a grain of sand or by connecting with the cosmos or by being reborn or, or whatever. Sure. But zombie is something scary that happens after death. Yeah. And I think it's also the fear, too, of the weird fear of strangers and your friends and family. Um, that occasionally people, you can be afraid of people and people snap. Yeah. People yeah. murder other people, even though we think, sure. oh, I, that would never happen. My coworker would never do that. But it happens. Yeah. And I think that there's a little bit of that fear of the violence in somebody else, what other people are capable of. Yeah. The, the, the and these, because the zombies are your friends and family. Yeah, they, they're, they, they're always, uh, George Romero said, hey, these, I'd always thought of them as, as my neighbors. As us, they are us. Yeah. Right, yeah, and yeah, so the they're sort of the like fear of death and the sleeping beast of, of evil or the devil that lives inside all of us because oh, we're oh, all capable. Think, which that would be a supernatural dimension it would, to them, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. we're all capable of violence, every, yeah. single one, every single human being, even Mother Teresa or Gandhi, yeah. given in the right context, would uh, commit violence, I think. Yeah. We're all... You, you know, we're, you say we're all fascinated with death, and, and we think about it, and we can't get it out of our minds because it's, it's, it's there for all of us, but we're also repulsed and fascinated with the actual physical decay of the body. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's the, 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 the cult of, 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 you know, following zombies and zombie literature and movies, and is, is that to sort of somehow make us... I don't know how to put it, to, to, to engross ourselves in it so it doesn't repulse us or it doesn't scare us so badly. The more we can take in, the, the, the more we can feel comfortable with it or something like that. Maybe, but I also think that people like to be scared and grossed sure. out about it. I mean, think about when you're a kid and you're on a camping trip or you're having a sleepover with your friends. One of the first things kids do is try and tell each other ghost stories and scare each other or say, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary ten times in front of the mirror to try and see the bloody baby or you see mm -hmm. Candyman sure, yeah. three times oh, in front yeah. of the mirror to, yeah. and they kids like to scare each other and I think 
we never really grow out of that. We, it's escapism, right? It, it's it's yeah. a trip. It's it's changing it is, your it's, reality. And you, yeah, you yeah. it's an adrenaline mm -hmm. pump yeah. too when sure. you when you are really frightened. Yeah. Although it's a sublimation, I hope, because most of us don't want to be a victim of a violent crime or to become a member of The Walking Dead or to commit a violent crime. So you think so it's we, to sort it out <clears throat> in our mind a little bit when yeah, you say sublimation. Yeah, yeah okay. right, to, yeah. to okay. sort of track it in some yeah. way that's safe. Okay, all right. How are they different from other monsters? I mean, what's, what, uh, what would be the difference between a zombie attack on my community and, and an attack of, uh, of giant crocodiles or something like that? Giant crocodiles? Or, or you know, what, what, what makes a zombie different? Why, why do people, I mean, zombies and vampires is who we want to read about well, and embrace now. The zombie... Not all of it. So. Right, right. <laughs> uh, zombie, zombie attacks, first of all, are only really scary when there's a horde of zombies. Okay. Um, I don't know if this exactly answers your question, but one yeah. zombie is laughable because they're so slow. You can outrun them. You mm -hmm. can outsmart them. But it's really scary when there's an entire, you know, hundreds of zombies just descending on sure. you. You're, then there's nothing you can do. They're everywhere. That's, that's the basis for most of the movies and most right. of the literature in the past. Your book is a little different. Right. And I, w I want to ask you, is it the first book that is not, we're pulling for the community to survive the zombie attack. Your, right. your book is like we're, we're pulling for the zombies to successfully create this, this voyage, or successfully complete this voyage, right. get right. where they're going and achieve their goal, right. like, like, like the Odyssey or something like that. I, it, yeah. Well, I did think of a little bit of the, ep the ancient little, epics, a little bit of, little bit of yeah, the hero sure. cycle. Yeah. Um, but there was also a book that came out when this book was being sold, uh, right around that same time, by S.G. Brown called Breathers. And it's also about a group of zombies that are trying to kind of integrate or would, and figure out how to live in society. But it's different. This is set right after the zombie apocalypse. Okay. And his is set after humans and zombies. Zombies already exist. They have to try and coexist. They're, they're not getting rid of them. But his book is great. It starts off with a scene where the main character eats his parents. Oh, God. And That's he feels guilty about it, but you know they're not zombies, and he couldn't help it, and he stores them in the freezer, and it's yeah. it's also a comedy. It's not like your book is devoid of scenes like that. I no, mean, no, it, it, there it are starts pretty much. I mean, not starts, but with the. Uh, protagonist uh, consuming his wife. Right, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, you have to play to I your... I don't want to... Spoiler alert okay. here for you. Yeah. You have to play it to your base. And in a zombie... This is a genre... Even though I like to think of this as a literary novel with zombies, it's still a genre novel. And you mm -hmm. have to have some of the conventions. And one of the conventions is gore. Yeah. Is the graphic oh. depiction of eating people. You, you don't you don't disappoint in that category. Thanks. There are truckloads of gore in this book. Oh God, I mean, I'm you, glad to hear it. Yeah, that's you, you, that's mission accomplished, right? That's that's what you were going <laughs> for. Tell us a little bit about the history of the genre. I mean, when did when would we did we first see zombies in well, literature? Well, in literature, you know, very recently, it's really started out as a film phenomenon with the 1969, 68, 69, Night of the Living Dead. Uh, the George Romero, which started the flesh-eating cannibal zombies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Prior to that, there was White Zombie, and I Walked with a Zombie, and a couple of other zombie movies, but they were the voodoo zombies, which is an individual that has been put under a, a, a curse by a voodoo bokor, and that and person... And they're slaves, more or less. They're basically, yeah, yeah they're, they're they slaves, do the bid, yeah. bidding of the voodoo bokor, and that can be broken if the bokor decides to, or by another powerful bokor. And those legends that. go... Way back, Way hundred back. years and right, more in right, time. Right, right, okay. And they are not flesh-eating cannibals. Oh. They are human beings that have unfortunately fallen under the sway of an evil, a powerful mystic. Yeah. Um, but the the flesh-eating zombies was, you know, the, the Romero. And, and in, in literature, it's really only been in the last couple of years that the zombies have moved from the visual to the written word. And for a long time, people didn't think that zombies could be written because they are so visceral because it is sure. about the glistening intestines and the blood dripping down the mouth and the eyeballs popping You're making out. A stand. And You're making a stand <laughs> to prove that wrong. I'll tell you, you can get plenty of that in there, but this inner voice of, of, of the main character is, right. is, is uh, he's all over the map. I mean, here's a guy with an active mind. Yes. Yeah. Zombie though he may be. Yeah. Oh, he's he's one smart zombie indeed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And any one in particular he's patterned after? No, any, any person? person? No, not really. You, just, perhaps? No. No, well, I'm not a zombie and I'm not a man. So no. those are two main things. But also, I've been in academia for a while and I've known a lot of 
um, academics who are like Jack in that, that it's very difficult to have a conversation with them. They always want to have the upper hand, sure. and I find yeah. it amusing. Yeah. They always want to, to prove their intelligence. And sometimes it's tedious. Most of the time it's amusing. So he's, he's sort of an amalgam of a lot of different academics that I've known. And, and within years. him, he knows he has the, the seeds of, of saving his entire oh, yeah. he's uh, ca completely, cast of characters, his whole zombie he's nation. He's an egomaniac. Right? He's an egomaniac, yeah. Which, yeah. which, you know, drives him. That keeps the plot going for, yeah. forward and so forth like that. The other characters in there, we have a nurse mm -hmm. zombie. I don't mm -hmm. think I'd ever heard of a nurse zombie before this book. Had, had you? No, no, I haven't. Yeah. And I hadn't heard much of people um, patching themselves up either to continue to survive. They usually don't care. They'll drop a limb and they'll just walk right over it. Keep so that was, that was kind of a way to just solve one of the problems of, right. of, of sustaining a, a character. Right, a, yeah. yeah. It, came out, character it kind of came out of necessity. When yeah. I first started writing the book, I, wasn't in, I was, in fact, intending it to be entirely Jack's voice and he would be the only one. And about 40 pages through, I realized it was going to be really boring if it was just Jack. He needed people yeah. to interact with, and he needed somebody to keep him moving. The only <laughs> non-zombie characters, and they don't stay non-zombies throughout the entire book, are, are, are who have any importance in the novel are the characters that Jack names Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, a couple of uh, soldiers right. who, are, who, are, uh, who capture them, as a matter of fact, and are their guardians for a while, or, or their, or their prison. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're, 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 they're prison jailers. Guards. Yes, for, there you for, go. For, for a while like that. And uh, is this the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern of Hamlet, or is this the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern of the of the play it's by the, Tom Stoppard? Stoppard. It's the, more the, of the Stoppard okay. Rosencrantz so, and so Guildenstern. So they're bumbling, sort of inept. Uh, yeah, they're yet, they're yet yet always curious type characters. Right. right. As a matter of fact, uh, the death scene when Guildenstern is dying or undying, they. Um, is some is sort of lifted, borrowed from some scenes in uh, the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are are dead. All right, something um, for the theater. I do that a lot in this book. There's to, a lot of for, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of high and low culture references, and there's even some um, lifts straight from Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. There are some lines straight from that, which are appropriated. Um, sure. Or you know, let's say stolen. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's plus, what writers I mean, do. That's you know? the high. The, you, you've got. Lyrics from Iron Maiden in there, and 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 Led Britney Zeppelin Spears and everything. Britney Spears is in Britney's there. Spears. I mean, you're you jam a lot of popular culture into yeah, that. Yeah, there's book. a lot of pop culture. What's, what's going on with that? What's well, the deal with that? I thought that first off, Jack likes pop culture. I mean, he's that kind of professor that he yeah. he's a postmodernist. Yeah. So he enjoys being knowledgeable about high and low culture. But mm -hmm. I also thought a zombie apocalypse represents the end of culture. It represents the end of civilization. Um, and but Jack is desperately holding on to the popular culture. And as he is devouring um, his family and his friends and, and everybody else, he's also sort of devouring and, and regurgitating popular culture. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, in some cases, it seems to me like it's, he has a throwaway line or a discount line. Any, anytime anything particularly repulsive happens, he throws in one of these, you know, a one -liner. current sayings of the day, you know, and, yeah. and something like that. And, and that's sort of, that's the way, you, I mean, that's the way you handle the gore in the book. You keep it at arm's length a little bit. It's, it's a yeah. joke that you sort of let everyone everyone in on. Right. Because How did you arrive at that tone for the book? Um, actually, that took a while to get the right voice for Jack. I mean, at mm. first he was serious and somber and really conflicted about eating people. He had a real moral dilemma. But then after a while, I thought, you know what? Once he turns a zombie, he's, this is the kind of guy who's going to love it. So then I sort of had to go back and, and rewrite some of that voice and make him accept it. And then I just... I just went with it. I mean, yeah. I didn't worry about making illusions that the readers wouldn't notice or, or wouldn't get. I knew some of them would get all of them, some of them would get some. But I, want, I wanted to make it a balance between a good story that everybody could follow and then people who were sort of in the know would enjoy the references. Like, similar to a sh television show like The Simpsons or Family Guy. Sure. Yeah. They're always making pop references to pop the Family culture. Guy came immediately to mind yeah, after right. I've been 10 pages in right. the book. Exactly. What, what else comes to mind is, is, as far as Jack's narration <clears throat> goes is, uh, I don't know if anyone has mentioned Jack Kerouac, you know, to you because, you know, the whole on the road legend of him writing it on an endless like piano right. roll. Right, right, a scroll. Stream and, of yeah. consciousness sort of that there's some of that in, in your in your character too. Oh, was, absolutely. Was that was that in your mind? Yes, you it were, was. Were, and yeah. as a matter of fact, there was an on the road reference that I wound up taking out because it didn't really seem to fit at the, at the time. But it's too old something. for the for the crowd. You're yeah, you're right. Here. Probably I mean, that's true. And this is all very. I mean, the shelf life of all these pop references is, is going to seem very 
quaint would be a good word in about three, two years, right? And that was one 18 thing, months. I yeah. thought about that when I was writing it, too. I sort of thought, what about, you know, the ages? Do I want this to, will this play in 30 years? Will this be a, li a book that will, I don't think so either, but that's okay. I, just, I, was, I was assuming that's your decision. Right, yeah, right. right. It was yeah. a decision. I yeah. wanted to have yeah. fun with it at the moment. And I was also really interested in or influenced by the writer Chuck Klosterman. I don't know, he wrote Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs, and his new book is Eating the Dinosaur. And he's very, he writes essays, but they're very similar in that he is really immersed in the now and what yeah. is going on in, in, in the popular culture world right now. And, and, and it might not last in 20 years, but then again, who knows, it might. People, you know, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, you can't read that without a, a huge amount of footnotes to understand sure. what's going on. Perhaps. This book could be footnoted Depends for on, yeah. for future uh, students of the twenty early part of the twenty first century. That might be part of the appeal of it, especially like, part of the once, charm of it. Yeah, especially once the zombie apocalypse really does happen. Then, then, then it'll it's, be it's like more a, like the a, Boy Scout a, handbook. Yeah, yeah it'll definitely. be like um, the Necronomicon or or Nostradamus. Nostradamus, exactly. That's, yeah. that's what you're shooting for there. I, I don't want to spoil any more of the book for for the for the viewers here. Let's talk about the whole thing. People of my age, we walk into the bookstore, we start living, and we, immediately we say, as, I, as I'll say at the top of the show, that what's with all the vampires, mm -hmm. the werewolves, and the zombies? Give us your take on that whole emergence of those, that genre and the subgenres within that over the past, what, four years? Right. Well, I think it is, like, you, like I said earlier, the fascination with death. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also unique to our time. Um, the millennium, I mean, even that. Seems a long time ago, but it was only 10 years ago, and I don't, I'm sure you remember, people were afraid that the world was going to end. Sure, they, they um, Y2K. Y2K, well, yeah. but, and also not just because of the computer breakdown, but also the whole, uh, it was the, the, Jesus was going to come back, I think, something, some kind of apocalypse, just the world. It we was, got another the, one coming up on the, on the 2012. On the, in our date book, you know, right. watch out. 2012 for it is another one. So I think there's part of that. And then I do think that 9 11, which happened just one year after. The, the millennium had something to do with our uh, current obsession with the undead. I mean, mm -hmm. we have new fears now in our society that we were very lucky to never have had before. Yeah. I mean, we'd never really been attacked on our soil. I mean, Pearl Harbor, of course, but there was not nearly the scale of 9-11. Of and we sort of had to realize that we're not invincible. We, we can be attacked. And yeah. I think that kind of changed our perception. And it was only a couple of years after that that people, that all these undead started arising. Yeah, yeah. The other viewpoint on that people would, would counter by saying you know what it may be a sign that that we're, we're actually in in placid times compared to you don't remember any i don't know of anything like goth kids during world war ii or world war right. one or the civil war <laughs> yeah. the vampire novel and writing and, and flourished during the victorian era when when england was at its peak that's true when, the, like when, that the, when dracula that, that, that came it's like out a, it's yeah. like we want something dark right. to balance all this unbearable brightness in our life so for is there is there some of that too? Or? Um, I don't know. I guess you got to choose one. I right? guess you do, and I would say that it's a little for me at least. Uh, my perception of it is that it is a little darker after, you know, after the terrorist attacks and the current. I mean, we've been in war now for ten years or mm -hmm. nine years, and the recession, and it seems like there's a lot of negativity. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know why people would find solace in the undead, but somehow they do, especially those sparkly vampires. Sure. Oh, boy, aren't they something? Yeah. Bef uh, I want to ask you what you're working on now, but before we get off the book, would you read a Oh, sure, absolutely. I think you've got something from the prologue. Maybe you yeah, can set it up Yeah, it's the prologue. You. Oh, yeah, well, it doesn't even need to be set up because prologue it's is the a first. Setup. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it sets up the book. Prologue. What you hold in your hands is a zombie memoir the touching post-life story of a walking corpse and his journey toward self-acceptance and knowledge, told honestly and in the first person, straight from his skeletal hand to your plump one. What you hold in your hands I wrote and left on top of the desk in my hideout, a log cabin in the northern wilds of Canada. It is nothing short of revolutionary. Revisionist historians, prepare to revise. In life, I was an English professor at a small college town in rural Missouri. My mind retained information like a steel trap. No one played Six Degrees of Bacon better than I. No one knew more about Walt Whitman, the New Testament, or B-movies from the 1950s. In conversation, I relentlessly, relentlessly sought the upper hand, whether discussing the best method for making flaky pie crust, use Crisco, not butter, or the cultural importance of Freud, as massive as his cigar. In death, I am a flesh-eating zombie with a messianic complex and these superpowers. I can think and I can write. My name is Jack Barnes and I am a survivor. This is my story. 
the words of Jack Barnes, the undead protagonist of uh, Brains, a zombie memoir. Robin Becker is here. What are you working on now, Robin? What's, what's, what's your next project? Are you going to stay within this genre? Or? No, um, not right now. Maybe in the future. I mean, I, the end book ends in a way that makes it open for a sequel, but I'm not run, kind of taking a break from zombies for now. I think the market is a little glutted, too, a little bloated. Um, there's a lot of it going around. There, there is. There sure yeah, is. there's. It's got rigor mortis. <laughs> but um, I'm working on a book that's called Mind Killer right now. The title could change, and it's a supernatural thriller. It's about a woman who has the psychokinetic ability to kill with her mind. She discovers this when she's a young girl, and it freaks her out. But as she grows up, uh, she accepts it, and she becomes a hit woman. Then she is faced with a moral dilemma at some point. Uh, she, there's, she discovers a person that she can't kill. Telekinetically, so she has to decide whether or not to kill them the old-fashioned way, or to uh, not do it and be in big trouble with her clients. Sounds good. Sounds good. It's fun. One more <laughs> note before we go: you're also spend some time on your your rock rock and roll band. Too, yes, that's correct? right. Yeah, I'm in a band called the Conway Tweeties, and um, if anybody is out there in the Central Arkansas area, we are our drummer is. Um, moving to Chicago, so we're looking for a drummer. And you can find information about the Conway Twitties at my website, which is www.robinzbecker.com. And we play a sort of a post-punk riot girl pop. All right, so drummer wanted for uh, the Conway Twitties. That's right. Uh, live or undead, I guess. E either undead way. would be rocking. Perfect. All right, if you're out there. This is the book, Brains, a Zombie Memoir. Robin Becker has been our guest today on On the Same Page. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Robin. Thank Appreciate you. That it. was great fun. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go on.